uh, lecture that is trying to prepare some ground for some of the things that we hear in the following talks, especially by Mark Meyer, Domenico Fiorenza, Hisham Saki, and so on. So this will be very introductory. I'll try to give some uh, idea of what higher super geometry is about, and what maybe also what higher means, as it also appears in our uh, conference cycle. So, so I'll start at the beginning, and curiously enough, the point maybe worth highlighting is that at the very beginning, we actually start with what you might call duality theory. So we have to pick which one to look at. So, so one reason we're all here is that we're concerned with duality of sorts, and um, informally that would mean some complementary perspective whose unity reveals deeper reality. <coughs> And there's a curious history of this concept. It was a big deal in the 19th century, in what at that time many people thought of as something like the theory of everything in philosophy, based on, on Hegelian uh, philosophy, duality played a central role. And then, of course, around the 20th and 21st century, there was this curious reappearance of the term in string theory. And um, I want to, as a kind of fun punchline, while we go through this, argue a little bit that this is not just entirely a coincidence of <coughs> terms. It's kind of a public secret that there's a good mathematical formalization of what it means for things to be dual or opposite to each other. And it's really the concept of a junction or joint equivalence or joint modality in uh, category theory. So I'll say just a little bit about basics of category theory because that will boost us to the homotopy theory that we need to talk about higher structures. And uh, I want to advertise this as something that gets us to speak about duality in the form of a junction. So there will be concepts of categories, functors, natural transformations, but we will need them in order to say what an injunction is, which we will need to say what a duality is. So a category of objects is just a set or class of elements, just as an ordinary set, but we do remember how there's maps between them, homomorphisms that uh, map from one of these things to another, preserving some structure possibly. And uh, the idea of the whole thing is a bit that of structuralism, that we say we, we identify the nature of the elements in such a category just by the way in which they're connected to all the other elements by these maps. So the basic examples of concrete categories are those who've already seen, <coughs> all seen, but let me just, just mention them. So the archetypical category that of sets, it's a large one, the class of elements, so the objects, the things in it are the sets, and we say that the maps between it are just the, the maps, the functions of sets. And then we can increasingly add structure to our sets to get something uh, richer. There's a category of topological spaces with morphisms of the continuous functions, a category of differential manifolds, whose maps are the differential functions, and so forth. We'll be much concerned with the category of algebras and ver of various sorts. So there's lots of versions of algebras and corresponding homomorphisms of algebras that we play with. So then, a function between two categories is a function between these things, say all mapping, uh, say all logical spaces in one category to algebras in another category, such that these morphisms, these maps between them, are respected in the evident way. So here's the first example that already gets us We'll see this more in Domenico Fiorenza's talk and maybe also in, uh, in some other talks. Um, or the simplest examples of uh, what these functors can do, Aisha, <laughs> uh, get us into territory that is closely related to business that we're interested in string theory. So a very basic example of category theory is that of an angle functor that goes from the category of topological spaces, of which we see one, two objects and one morphism on the right, to itself, which simply takes every topological space and crosses it with the circle, takes the Cartesian product of the circle, takes a new space that is a trivial circle fiber bundle over the original one. So this being a functor means that, and that's the important point, not just that we map the objects here to something new, but we know what to go to maps. So if we have a map from one space to another, which we might, in this room, might think of as being a field of a sigma model, mapping some brain world volume to a target space, then we can apply this functor to this whole morphism to get a map from this brain, which is now one dimension higher, to this target space, which is one dimension higher. So this would now be a P plus one brain that wraps around the circuit fiber of that new increased target space. So this is elementary and very simple. You might think maybe it's just a coincidence that you know, 
we see some dimensions appear here, or the way we used to make in string theory, but we'll actually see some theorems that this goes right to the heart of the method. So there's a kind of dual example to this. In precise sense dual, we'll, we'll see that duality made precise in just a moment, which is that there is a functor also from topological spaces to topological spaces that forms loop spaces. So it takes topological space to the topological space of continuous functions from the circle to X. Topologize with a compact open topology. And maybe we want eventually to have compactly generated spaces. This too is a functor. If you have if you have a function between two spaces, think of it as a function maybe of two target spaces, maybe it can be that line compactification from a high dimensional space compactifying down to y, then we know what it means to send loops in x to loops in y simply by pushing them forward. Which if you think of this here as being a um, configuration space of strings on uh, this high dimensional space x, it tells you how to map these string configurations down to the compactified space. So these are very elementary basic examples of category theory and uh, functors. So next, remember our uh, transition, we want to speak about duality, which needed categories, functors, and natural transformations to be formalized. So next we'll talk about natural transformations. Suppose we have two functors between two categories, two categories C and D, two functors F and G between them. Then there's a notion of what it means to have a map between these two functors for the natural transformations. And the definition is it's for each object here, object X and C, is a morphism in D between the two images <coughs> under F and G. <coughs> component of the natural transformation. So that makes it a transformation. It sends all these images to these other images. But it's natural in the sense that it respects composition on both sides. If you have any morphism, morphism here in C, and the corresponding images under F and under G, then we have this square, which will always mean, and does mean here, that going around the two ways in the square and the, the composition of morphisms gives the same result. So it means that this composite that's the, the definition of a natural transformation on this introductory talk. We, we don't go into the, you know, not, won't fully unwind this, but, but you can check easily at home, maybe, or just right now, mentally, that the following are examples of such natural transformations. So these two functors that we just saw, they actually uh, interact with each other um, by such natural transformations. So for every topological space, there's a, there's a, evident, canonical, but actually very interesting and useful map from that space itself to the loop space, the space of maps from S1 to the Cartesian product of that space with the circle. And that is the map that takes uh, every point, any, right, it's some continuous <coughs> function, this is in the category of topological space, so it's some continuous functions, it takes every point in X to the loop that winds at unit speed around the fiber over that point in that trivial circle one. Conversely, there's an evaluation map. You see, we use the two functors, maps outside, S1 inside. We can also use S1 outside, maps inside. There's a functor from, you form the loop space, and the Cartesian product with S1. There's a canonical morphism from there back to X, which takes, which takes the loop gamma, which takes the point in S1 and evaluates the loop at that point. And these two morphisms, this one here and this one, they are natural, as you can easily convince yourself of maybe using a piece of paper and a pen. If you have a morphism here, there's an induced morphism here, and the corresponding square commutes. It's what makes these transformations be good. So in the notation we just introduced, this means that if you look at these functors that go between topological spaces, we have an identity functor here, right? This is the image on an identity functor of the space X. And we have one transformation, eta here, from the identity to the loop space of the fiber product and another transformation from the product with S1 to the loop space. And these, these two natural transformations, they <coughs> interact in a, in a good way now that exhibits the fact that there's some duality at work here. So to say this, we call the definition or quickly highlight the definition of the junction. So this is what we were really after, this is what will drive the, the whole theory. So an adjunction of categories or an adjoint pair of functors is two categories, C and D. Functors going between them, one in one direction, the other going in the other direction. Such that there are natural transformations from sort of the identity to you know, one functor applied to the other and the other way around. So the unit and the co-unit. And uh, the Q 
your condition is that these are required to satisfy the zigzag identity that you see displayed in these diagrams here. So, so there's an evident way to compose these natural transformations by, by composing the component morphisms. And uh, the condition on an adjunction is that if you kind of do it, apply them next to each other this way, the result has to be equal to the identity and the other way around. So this is called the zigzag identity or triangle identity of an adjunction. It turns out to be equivalent, it's a little exercise to the following condition. That um, and this is where the, the name adjoint functors really comes from, which says that um, there's a natural bijection between the sets of homomorphisms between images of this left functor to anything, to uh, morphisms out of the original object into the image of the right functor. So it means if you have any morphism out of the image of the left adjoint to somewhere, there's an associated morphism that goes out of this object into R of the other one. So you throw over L from the left to the right in this home set. This is a natural bijection. So in our examples, <coughs> what, we, what we really saw, these two functors in the previous case made up an adjunction that is known as a product mapping space adjunction. It says that this functor that forms loop spaces is really the right adjoint, it's dual in, in a precise sense, it's the functor that produces trivial circle fiber bundles over a given space. And this adjunction, if you work, work it out, this adjunct isomorphism <coughs> takes what you should think of as a world volume of a, of a brain whose world volume has this as one factor into some target space Y to the corresponding map out of just this piece of the brain volume, the lower dimensional one, into the loop space of the original target space. So to which here you see a T plus one brain propagating in some Y, and there's a bijection to a propagation of a P brain in some larger space. So I'm not, I'm not explaining this here, but I'll, I'll claim at this point that this is actually um, the basis of the formalization of double dimensional reduction, at least on brain charges. And um, we'll see more on this in, in the talks by Domenico, Fiorenza, Brahmach, Maya, Vincent, is he here? Oh, there's Vincent, yeah. And maybe a new chance of this talk. So maybe keep this in mind. It's, it's the most basic example of an adjunction in our category theory, and it will get us right at the heart of some string theoretic dualities. There's another type or kind of functors that will uh, greatly concern us in the following, where we want to set up super geometry. And that's functors that assign algebras of functions to given spaces. So very generally, if you have any setup, we have some notion of spaces, some category of spaces, say topological spaces or differential manifolds or something more fancy. Yes. Then you can consider uh, functors that take each space to something like an algebra of functions on that space. And if that works well, there should be a map that you know should become a functor by sending maps between these spaces to the corresponding algebra homomorphisms that are given by the free composition to that function. So we see an example of a, of a functor to an opposite category. As you see, the morphisms here go in one direction, the morphisms here then go in the other direction because they're given by the free composition. This is still a category, it's just the, the morphisms run in the other direction, so we call it the opposite of the category of algebra. Some people, categories here, like to like to reserve the word duality for equivalences between categories and opposite categories, uh, putting emphasis on this uh, opposition as being the dual part, but I think the notion makes sense in general. The key point will be for us that in good cases, and we'll see examples in a moment, in good cases these functors are fully faithful. And that's a simple but powerful statement. It means that in some precise sense they actually exhibit this category of spaces is being a subcategory, a full subcategory, sitting really inside algebra's op. The precise definition of what this means is that there's a bijection between the home set, the set of homomorphisms between any two spaces, and the set of algebra homomorphisms between the algebras of functions. So remember by this uh, ideology of structuralism in category theory, we, we know that the 
has the same morphisms between these things. It means for all practical purposes, these gadgets behave as if they were the same thing. So it says, whenever we're in such a situation that we have a fully faithful functor from spaces to other dust, we may just as well think of our spaces as actually being the corresponding objects in this opposite category. So we have we get an algebraic characterization of space and thereby a a generalization, which may be a vast generalization of the written concept of spaces because there may be many more algebras than arise as actual algebras of functions on spaces. Another way to say this, what I just said is that if you have a fully faithful function, it becomes actually an equivalence of categories. If you co restrict it, so if you just look at those algebras that are in the image of this function, those algebras that do arise as algebras of functions of on given spaces, we call those good algebras for just a second. Then fully faithful function is co-restricted to those things that are in its image become an equivalence of becomes an equivalence of categories. Which means in a precise sense that these these two categories are equivalent contexts to work in for doing geometry. And this still sits in this bigger category, possibly bigger category. The archetypical example of this, which, which got algebraic geometry started back then, is Gelfand duality which is not concretely of interest for what we're doing now. We need some variants of this, but, but it's historically maybe the first really important example. It says that if you restrict topological spaces to the compact host of spaces, the generalizations of this, but this is the easiest context, then take the, the function that simply say, takes algebras of, of complex number valued continuous functions on these spaces, that happens to land Priori, it goes to topological algebras, but it happens to land in C star algebras that are commutative. It's uh, functional to an opposite category, as we saw before. So, um, so we have this assignment that sends topological spaces to nice algebras, and that turns out to be an equivalence of categories, which means if you study compact house of spaces, you can just as well study commutative C star algebras, which is, of course, the beginning of much of operator algebra. So that, um, that is the archetype of the duality, of, of the duality between algebra and geometry that we will be concerned with, but we need some, or we want to concentrate on some other variants of this. So here's a table of more examples of this duality between geometry and algebra that is formalized by this concept of conjunctions and equivalence of categories. So we've just seen Gelfand duality here, topological space are equivalent to C star commutative topological algebra. Whenever you have such an equivalence, it means you can generalize it. So since there are many more topological algebras than those that are C star and commutative, you can, uh, you can say, you know, just declare that those more general algebras in their opposite category with their morphism preserved play the role of generalized spaces. We take it, we drop the commutativity condition. We have some notion of non-commutative spaces here, or algebras here, which if you think of them as being algebra function would be spaces gives us a definition of a new category of non-commutative topological space. It's the beginning, of course, as you know, non-commutative geometry. <coughs> so when Grotenik saw Gelfand do his Gelfand duality, he uh, kind of said, let's make this definition for plain algebras, maybe finite, uh, type reduced algebras, or some field, and, uh, and declare form duals of these algebras to be affine schemes, to be the objects of interest in algebraic geometry. So in algebraic geometry, one kind of takes what one found as a theorem here in topology as the defining um, property of what a space, a scheme should be. We'll be interested in doing this in the context in physics, happens in algebraic geometry and other topology, but in differential geometry. We'll be interested in boosting this to the context of smooth manifolds, where um, the analog of Gelfand duality um, is a, is a well-known but not widely appreciated equivalence that sometimes goes by the names by the name Müller's exercise. It says that if you take the evident functor that sends smooth manifolds to their real algebras of smooth functions, just plain real smooth functions, then that gives you a fully faithful functor. So that means that if you have two smooth manifolds, then Smooth functions, the set of smooth functions between these two smooth manifolds is actually in bijection with the set of algebra homomorphisms the other way around between the algebra functions. So that means we can study.
study smooth manifolds equivalently by studying these commutative algebras of smooth functions. That they have. And again, that's good because there's more algebras than there are algebras of smooth functions and actual spaces. We can do <coughs> super geometry, and now we're getting slowly to the topic of this talk here. As you all know, we get in, uh, in super geometry by saying, well, let's say slightly non commutative algebras, and we super commutative algebras. So I'm displaying a decade of what you might call super Cartesian spaces. Or you would say we want a new space that's like Cartesian space Rn, but with, with q upgraded directions. And it's formalized by declaring that the algebra of functions in this guy is the algebra of smooth functions on its on its bosonic part, tensored with the Grassmann algebra, but I'll say that in my detail in just a moment, uh, on q generators. And um, we may boost this to some higher geometry. Um, Get the notion of super elliptic algebra. I'll have more to say about this in just a second. So let's talk a bit about super algebra because there's some, of course, all of you are not assuming that you don't know this, but since this is a, supposed to be an introductory talk, I thought I'd take the time to highlight a few mm. very simple but still kind of subtle aspects that uh, are important. All right. So as a definition, so we we wanna we wanna what we wanna do now is maybe say we wanna just analyze this last, these last kind of examples in a bit more detail and see how, these, how exactly these algebras arise and how we can handle them and what kind of spaces they do or they define. All right, so I'm going to speak about differential graded commutative super algebra. This is the pairing of the concept of commutative or super commutative super algebra and differential graded algebra. So there's two kinds of gradients in the game. There's the total is z times z mod 2 or f2 if you wish. Uh, gradient. Um, I'm going to write. I'm going to write n uh, by default for the cohomological grading in the z factor, and sigma for the super grading in this other factor. And we say an algebra, if a differential graded commutative super algebra, if it's graded by this group, so if multiplication uh, induces uh, addition in these groups for the degrees of the elements that we multiply. Uh, if it's in addition equipped with a derivation that's a differential of degree 1, comma e, so cohomological degree 1, and being super e. There is a, there's actually two different sign rules for what it means to have a differential graded commutative super algebra, given that we have these two different degrees here. This is uh, highlighted a bit in the IIS volume. They call it the Lean's volume, uh, the, the Lean's convention, Bernstein's convention, even though, of course, these conventions go um, back way beyond these, these two. Years. So, in one convention, you say we have a differential grade commutative algebra and two elements of homogeneous degree, n, i, sigma, i, and n, j, sigma, j. Then, if you, if you make them switch places, you pick up a sign that is the, the product of one sign for the cohomological <coughs> degree and one sign for the super degree. And in the other sign rule, you, you say you pick up a single sign with just a parity. You add these two things, mod C2, and then take a sign. So this seems to be dominant, or is it dominant in the supergravity literature? Early references is from Nova and other 87. It's used extensively in this textbook by Kata, Dari and Freon, geometric supergravity. And this is a convention that is picked by Deline Fried in the IIS volume. This other convention, uh, maybe fashionable among several of the participants in the audience. This uh, is what one gets if one thinks of AKS Z models in the original perspective. An important point that Gilbert and us want to uh, formalize is that these two conventions are equivalent. There's a, a strong monoidal equivalence of categories that makes the algebras in these two cases equivalent. But I'm not going to talk about so here's a very basic special case of DGC superalgebras that we'll be concerned with. Roughly, we can build a table and say, okay, we have these two degrees. Um, if, if the cohomological degree is zero and the super degree is even, we have just a plain commutative algebra. If uh, super degree is still even, but n is allowed to be arbitrary, that's an ordinary differential grade commutative algebra. If sigma is arbitrary, but still the cohomological degree is zero, then the basic example is that of a Grassmann algebra, and both are arbitrary in the differential grade. Right, so Grassmann algebra is one that is freely generated on a bunch of odd-graded generators. I think you all know, we're throwing some odd-graded generators and the 
clear and say enter commute. Using this, we can now be precise about what we meant by the super Cartesian space R and Q. So we define R and Q to be the formal dual of super commutative algebras, or differential weights of over algebras of the form ordinary smooth functions, real algebra smooth functions on an ordinary Cartesian space, and such grass We look at the literature on supermanifolds, so they often like to introduce them as locally ringed topological spaces, which is a lot of machinery that in the end, um, due to Miller's exercise, collapses to the simple definition that the objects we're dealing with are just the formal duals of these algebras of functions. So it's useful to just introduce them right away this way. Now given a super Cartesian space, we get a more interesting differential grade primitive super algebra, the algebra of differential form. All this is very basic and just to, since this will reappear and science will play a role in, in later talks, I just want to, I thought it would be worthwhile to, to say it precisely <laughs> once. So, um, given any R and Q, we can form a differential graded computer, a uh, differential graded computer of superalgebra that is free over this algebra of functions on the super Cartesian space, which we just saw, on bunch of generators. And generators we call DXA, it's supposed to be the differentials of the even coordinate functions, to so by degree one comma even, one due to the d and even because it started all even and the differential is even, and it generates d theta alpha and by degree one odd. So in formulas right like so we say the differential forms on R and Q, it's the algebra freely generated as a differential rate between the algebra, super algebra from these generators over the space of functions. Which just breaks comes down to the usual formula you know for differential forms. You expand them in wedge products of these beasts here uh, with coefficients in that function algebra. Just to highlight with these by degrees, there's a, yeah, I'm not going to work through it. There's different signs for these two different conventions, which is good to know if you, if you look at the literature. I'm not going to go through this, but it follows from the sign rules here a bit. There's evident notion of pullback of differential forms that we get just as well algebraically. You see, one point I'm making is that we're just defining this algebraically. We're not talking about you know, ring morphisms between locally ring spaces or something. You just see that all of this just comes from the dual category of super differential algebras. So for any morphism between the super Cartesian spaces, which by definition is now an algebra homomorphism, super commutative algebras, the other way around from this, which was you know, smooth functional now. R into tensor grasp and algebra. There's a unique extension to a DG homomorphism, DG algebra homomorphism, that uh, respects the differentials on both sides and is, is an extension, so is that morphism on the uh, degree zero part, just, just by the freeness of this original construction. So this, this means that you see we can functorially assign morphisms here with morphisms going the other way here and so create. Forming, uh, forming super differential forms and super Cartesian spaces is another functor in terms of the again, fully faithful, easily checked. The category of super Cartesian spaces that embeds it into the opposite differential rate commutative super algebras. And again, we, we will eventually now think of this as, being, as allowing us to generalize. So we obtain super Cartesian spaces by generalizing algebraically from ordinary Cartesian spaces to super spaces. Now we see uh, it still sits pretty faithfully in this yet larger thing where we have a differential grading here. And this allows us to speak about yet more general spaces. And this will be the super L infinity algebra. So to see this, first recall the basic fact that if G is an ordinary super Lie algebra of finite dimension, so Lie algebra with a Zemo 2 grading such that so the, the, the bracket is too symmetric sense, then we can form the thing that is called the chevalier allenberg algebra, ever since Chevalier and Allenberg work on this, is the differential grade primitive algebra, which is the free grade primitive algebra on the underlying dual vector space of G. So, so we put G in the cohomology degree 1 and use whatever super degree we had, and then just simply form the free grade primitive algebra. And then the original Lie bracket, since we dualized, defines 
it's linear dual, which is now mapped from one copy of G star to two copies of G star, and it does land in this greater commutative copy due to the skew symmetry, greater skew symmetry of the super bracket. So that gives us a map from uh, you know, one copy of G star to two copies of them, and then extending by Leibniz rule, the graded super Leibniz rule, we get differential on the whole algebra. So this is called the Chevrolet Einberg algebra of the given super D algebra. If the super D algebra happens to be an ordinary D algebra, that's the ordinary Chevrolet Einberg algebra that you find in, in most textbooks, and the on E theory and the generalization to super theory is uh, the average form. So equivalently, just as a side remark, there's a notion of global notion of super Lie group associated with our finite type super Lie algebra, and it turns out um, we can form among the super differential forms on the super Lie group those that are left invariant in super generalization of the ordinary notion of left invariants, and it turns out to be an equivalent uh, way to get a hold of the Schiller algebra if that Lie group, if the bosonic body, is the simple connected Lie group corresponding. So we see that um, Lie algebras also embed into our algebraic uh, context of differential grade commutative supergroups. The key example for doing space-time geometry they're really interested in, we see, see this in, we'll see this in great detail in John Weather's talk, maybe on Wednesday now, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> or it keeps changing at some point, some more this week. Uh, but just briefly, uh, to to see how things fit together. Uh, if you pick um, a natural number dimension D, then you can ask for a real spin representation of the corresponding Lorentzian spin group. And um, given that, we can form um, the differential grade commutative super algebra, formally dual to super Lie algebra, which, which I'm going to call R, D minus 1, 1 slash N, or that's, that's what it's called, the, the super Minkowski space time dimension D and N super symmetries. And it's defined, uh, or maybe fully characterized, by saying that Chevrolet Einberg algebra is generated by generators uh, EA in degree 1, comma, even, and the by degree 1, comma, even. And uh, 1, comma, odd graded guys, psi, um, if we declare the differential to be as follows the, the, the psi is simply closed under this Chevrolet Einberg differential, while the differential of the E's is. is uh, quadratic expression in the size that is given by the canonical spinner to vector pairing that one obtains whenever n is a real spin representation, which in the usual component of the just means you the sandwich the gamma matrix between between the size. So that fully defines super Minkowski space time as a super Lie algebra at this point. Just to em emphasize if you do think of super Minkowski space time as a Super Cartesian space, then it has canonical coordinates x and theta, then the generators we just saw correspond to the canonical uh, super left invariant super field line on that space time. So then you can declare that the psi is just the d thetas, but the e's are not the d x's as you would have for the canonical field line on Minkowski space time, because they wouldn't be left invariant. Here, the very interesting fact is that uh, super symmetry in the algebra was slightly non-commutative, witnessed by this quadratic pairing here, right? This was, remember, this is the dual of a Lie bracket, so it says there's a non-trivial Lie bracket pairing, super Lie bracket pairing to fermions to boson, so it's not an abelian Lie algebra, it's a super Lie algebra, and as a result, this, this naive field line is not actually left, super left and right anymore, the corresponding correction term is of this form, and uh, so it pairs, you know, thetas and thetas. And for this, it follows immediately if you hit this again with D, that we get the Schiller Einberg relation that D of E is psi to question psi. So this is really important for some space time applications of these things. When you think of, you can identify the elements in the Schiller Einberg algebra with canonical superfield lines on the local tension spaces. Right, so. It's now an easy, not even an exercise, an easy uh, thing to check that homomorphisms of super Lie algebra is a natural bijection with the dual homomorphisms of the Chevrolet Allenberg PGC super algebra. So it says if you have two super Lie algebras, G1 and G2, then having a homomorphism between them in this direction is, if you 
F1 of n, you get induced a homomorphism of TGC supplied to us the other way around. But again, this is a projection, actually. Every such homomorphism comes from uh, one of this form. And so this means for me, Shevard Amberg algebra is a full embedding of the category of super the algebra into the opposite of TGC super algebra. I guess we see, we'll see more of this in, in other people's talk. Yes. Using this, Sticking to our philosophy or to this to this general attitude here, that if we have a fully faithful embedding, we can regard the right side as being a good generalization of what happens on the left side. We now generalize super Lie algebra by making the schedule bigger inside this, this dual right side. So we may characterize, we may say what is the super L infinity algebra of finite type by just lifting you know, looking at the previous characterization of super Lie algebra in terms of the dual Schiffer Amberg algebra, and just lifting the constraint, removing the constraint that everything is generated in cohomological degree one. So we say it's a z graded super vector space G, degree wise of finite dimension, to make it finite type. And then for all the natural numbers, uh, a multilinear map, such that the graded derivation you get by, by adding all these multilinear maps up. Uh, gives you a uh, differential on this dual algebra. So effectively what we're saying, we say we do the same construction of Sherman Ironberg algebra as we did for an ordinary Lie algebra, super Lie algebra, only that we don't insist that G star is concentrated in just one degree. We allow it to be concentrated in arbitrary uh, cohomological degrees and of course be a super vector space in each degree. So this defines a full subcategory of all DGC super algebras, which sometimes are called the semi-free or quasi-free super DGC algebras. It's those whose underlying groups graded super cognitive algebra is free on a, on a super on a graded super vector space. But the differential is non-trivial. In fact, all the information about the Lie brackets are higher brackets. So these are now higher brackets that generalize the, the plain binary bracket on a super Lie algebra. They encode the structure on this thing. So this, let's see, do I have this on the next slide? This is slightly more nice. So there's a convoluted history of this, this way of looking at uh, L infinity algebra. Um, but the point I want to emphasize is that uh, this perspective of looking at super Lie algebra in terms of the Sheffield Arnberg algebra and then allowing generators of higher cohomological degree is an ancient idea in physics. This is what uh, what Fernandez and uh, Daria Frey uh, started doing in 1982. And slightly unfortunately, they called these algebras FDAs, short for free differential algebras, which is mathematically not the correct term because the differential is not free; it's a semi-free. But, but this term is entirely uh, stuck and is the canonical term in supergravity literature. They speak of FDAs, and um, they are a bit shy about admitting that they are dual to finite type super L infinity algebra, but it's easy to see. It was really first observed in the case by maybe Lana Marta, and maybe Anna Fry, and maybe Arthur. So that's another example of duality. Because what they're saying is that there's a free duality between the two geometric notions and an algebraic notion. One important uh, thing that some of the talks will build on is that. Um, <laughs> Once we're in the setup of super and infinity algebras, there's a, there's a curious enrichment of the theory that is happening, of which we now see increasingly many uh, hints. So one way of seeing what's going on here is that you might start getting interested into, in L infinity algebras, even if you just start being interested in ordinary Lie algebras, but you ask yourself, what is it that a higher cocycle classifies? So remember that B plus 2 cos, I got to be counting this way. This is the way to count so that everything comes out right if you do apply it to, to, to green towards P grain signal. So if you have a P plus 2 cos cycle on an ordinary Lie algebra, so it means you have a P plus 2 area function on the Lie algebra to R, which is geosymmetric, multilinear, and it satisfies some, some condition, cos cycle condition, it's called a cos cycle, and a, this condition is always a bit hard to read on the board, but the nice thing about this dual perspective, it reduces simply to the following duality. It's equivalent to the statement that 
you know, mu is modeled in a symmetric map from copies of G to R, since this is a finite type, you can identify it with an element in the Schäfer Almer algebra of the D algebra, and then this condition just boils down to saying that it's a closed element. So closed cycles on a super D algebra are just closed element in its uh, Schäfer Almer algebra. And this, of course, uh, the classical use of Schäfer Almer algebra, because this is why. She, why in this theory, Schäfer Einberg was introduced in order to compute the algebra cohomology, and the aspect that they actually uh, dually incarnate the full category of the algebra is often uh, not highlighted in this. You know. So, for instance, an ordinary two cost cycle, which is what the classical textbooks are concerned with, um, corresponds, for example, to the result to a central extension of the algebra. So, we have this cost cycle here on an ordinary the algebra G. And we can add a new copy of R to our original vector space and <coughs> find a new bracket, which is the original bracket on the original generators here, and then pairs two um, original generators to one of these new opinion generators using the cosine. In fact, this is actually the algebra set such that the covariant is perfectly equivalent to the cosine condition on a new In terms of dual server Eilenberg algebra, this simply means that this will play a big role in. Uh, um, it simply means that we start with the Sheffield Einberg algebra of the original the algebra, we adjoin one generator in uh, degree one comma even in this case, and then we have to say what does the differential do on this generator. This is the only information that is hidden in the Sheffield Einberg algebra, it's just a bunch of generators. We declare what does the differential do to them. We declare that the differential takes it to that cosine. So it trivializes the cosine. And then we can check that. And d squared group zero is now manifestly equivalent to d mu two is zero, which is the cosine condition. So a non-classic effect, which is just as easy to see, but it's not widely widely advertised, is that we can play the same game now that we're in the context of super infinity and with the higher cosine. Suppose you have a general of p plus two cosine. It still corresponds to an extension, but now it's a higher central extension to an infinity. So it's an infinity algebra that reads like so, but let me just right away skip to the dual algebraic picture. It has a similar definition now, which directly mimics the previous one, just shifting degrees. So the original Schäfer Einberg algebra, we added generated now degree p plus one comma even. We need to declare what is the differential, and if we say that the differential be a trivialization of the cosine. That is a that yields uh, an L infinity algebra that extends the ordinary D algebra G regardless. Even if you weren't interested in n infinity algebras in the, in the first place, but you studied the cohomology of ordinary D algebras, they eventually led to asking what do these cosines like classify? And they classify nothing in ordinary D theory, they classify something in n infinity theory. Right, there's a, there's a famous cycle, for instance, on every semi simple two cycle, sorry, three cycle on every semi simple D algebra. It carries a killing form pairing. Using the killing form pairing, you can form a trilinear map by feeding in three elements, bracketing two, and taking the killing form of the result. This defines uh, a three cycle and it uh, classifies an L infinity algebra, which gains some fame with the string E2 algebra. I think we'll see more about the string E2 algebra maybe in Christian's talk. Now the definition you know, of this extension and of those cost cycles, the way we set it up, <coughs> it didn't need the assumption that we started with an ordinary Lie algebra. We can take any L infinity algebra G, it doesn't have to be a Lie algebra, super infinity algebra, and simply declare that the cost cycle is a closed element in its Schäfer Einberg algebra. And then once we have this, we can form this extension. We can form a new Schäfer Einberg algebra by using the old part and join one generator, take its differential to be cosine. This way, once we're in the setup of super L infinity or of L infinity theory, Extension theory becomes extremely rich for if you pick any one super L infinity algebra, it might be a very puny one, very tiny one. You can increasingly ask for higher central extensions. You ask, can I find a cost cycle of some degree extend? Can I find a cost cycle extend? Can I find another cost cycle extend extend? So for every super L infinity algebra, there extends now a bouquet of higher central extensions. That turns out to be interesting for certain cases. We'll come back to this. Yes, so all your co-cycles are trivial here because you need this trivialization to be like... Ah, good question. No, they're not trivial, but they're, they're, 
the force to become trivial on the extension. Uh, you see, uh, good point, thanks. So let's look at let's look at this. Right, yeah, good point. We'll, we'll see this in a moment. This this exhibits the fact that we have a HDA homomorphism with five of the cosines. So here's the the original separate Einberg number. The cosine need not be trivial, of course it could be. Then we have an homomorphism to this bigger algebra, and in here the cosine is kind of formally trivialized. We introduce in, so here there's a new generator that does trivialize. So up here the cosine is trivialized. Yeah, we'll see it in just a moment. There's this concept of white tau. You can ask, so what have a bunch of codes I can see? Let's, trip, let's force them to become trivial step by step. So you, you continue doing this construction, forming ever higher central extensions, making more and more codes like this trivial. And then you end up with an interesting super infinity algebra. Yeah. All right, so to, to get deeper into this story that is beginning to emerge here, we need to perspective from just pure algebra for a second and start talking about uh, homotopy theory. So there's a, big, there's a big story here. Let me just briefly indicate some some highlights maybe in a super superficial way. <laughs> so traditionally in mathematics and physics, you know, what we found on set theory where you just say some, our basic concept is just bags of points, no further stretch. But this is not one of these coincidences. It seems a bit like a it seems a bit like a like a game with words at the beginning, but it turns out to be a deep concept. Fundamental physics is governed by the gauge principle. The gauge principle really says that given any two things, so things would mean field histories in physics, it's wrong in general to ask whether they're equal or not. That's not that's just not the right question. You should ask, is there a gauge transformation between them or not? And if there is one, you should you may have to you know care about which one. There may be more than one, and it may matter, say if you do boundary field theory, which one you pick. So let's denote the situation where it's such a morphism, such, a, such an arrow. We say x and y are two field histories, and they are not necessarily equal, but they're related by gauge transformation, which we call gamma. And, and so that idea is really what a math is called, the concept of mod. We'll, we'll come to the more details of this, but just, just as a, how, how things fit together. Now the interesting thing about this, if you're really serious about it, it this concept applies to itself. It says, you now if you have two gauge transformations, gamma one and gamma two, between two field histories, it's wrong to ask whether they're equal or not in general. It might be that these field, are field histories of higher form gauge fields, B fields, C fields, RR fields, and then there are gauge of gauge transformations, or you know, AKS E model fields. Or so we should ask, is there a gauge transformation relating this gauge transformation to this one? Gauge of gauge transformation. And it keeps going. Next, it's wrong to ask if these two gauge of gauge transformations are equal or not. We have to ask if there's a gauge of gauge transformation between them and so on. So, in mass research, this kind of yoga is called, and that's where the higher and higher structures really come in. This is called forming well, high gauge transformations and higher homotopies. Mathematician calls the structure where, where this kind of situation makes sense a higher homotopy type. So, if this, if this has gauge of gauge of gauge transformation, you would say it's at least a homotopy three type. Let's go to the higher ones. So ordinary set theory is zero types, no homotopies, and then you start in your homotopies that things become higher in the sense of homotopy theory. So anti-homotopy theory, it's much like set theory, but wherever we see a concept of equality in set theory, we now replace it by gauge transformations. So we build them right into the foundations. One can make this uh, surprisingly precise. So good so long as I think homotopy theory is based mathematics. One way to think of it. So here's here's now a bit more detail on what homotopies really are. I can't give a full account of homotopy theory, but the basic idea is, uh, is easily grasped. So if we if you think of x and y, no, the, no, the is not fully, uh, if we think of them as being curves or paths in <coughs> some space, then uh, you know, just an example of what it means to saying that f and g, these two images of this interval here, yeah, may not be equal, but still be equivalent for practical purposes, maybe that we can continuously deform them one into the other. The way to formalize this mathematically is to write these diagrams. And it maybe looks a bit uh, fancy here, but it's a very simple idea. You say this box here, to so this cylinder, if you think of this being x, it's the cylinder of x times the interval. And we ask if there's one map from x times the interval to y, so that would be this full region here, which when we restrict to 
One boundary becomes F, and when we restrict to the other boundary becomes G. This is what it says. There's a dual way of looking at this. It's the same duality that we started out with, the Cartesian product mapping space duality. Equivalently, it just means you have a single map. So this is one map from this box here to, to Y. It's the same thing as a map um, to the path space. So that's a, that's a type where you only set to be Ys. Call this a left homotopy and a right homotopy. So in order to speak about this, in order to formalize homotopies, what we need is we need to get hold of these uh, cylinder objects, or we need to know what, what the general path space of it is. Now, this was a major insight by a bunch of people committed, committed in Köln's work in around 67, how to neatly formalize this again in the context of category theory. So we say that category is good. This is a very rough, there's not a definition, this is a very rough characterization of the actual definition. But roughly, again, so that's the idea. A category with a good supply of both cylinder objects and past space objects, such that we may do, we may speak about a multiple theory in a sensible way, as part of the previous slide, it's called a model category. Some people call it a quill and close model category. The, the way to read this out is, this is short for it, it's a category of models for a multiple type. It means if you have this, Every category, every object in this category may be understood as a homotopy type, as something that has things and higher homotopies. We'll see that. Important will be that whenever you have a homotopy category, sorry, a model category, there's a homotopy category associated with it, where you kind of extract the homotopy relevant information. Its objects are just the good models for homotopy types. In order to make this precise, we need to delve a bit into the theory. So, one achievement of model category theory is that it allows you to pick along or possible models, particularly good ones. So this is the technical thing I'm going to explain now, the fiber and co-fiber ones. And then the morphisms of the homotopy category are the homotopy classes of morphisms we see between good objects. So when you identify two such, if they're related by a homotopy, if they're gauge equivalent. Okay. So, the, so the punchline here is that adding just a little bit, or maybe semi little bit of information to a plain category, boosts us up to homotopy theory. That's really the main role that category theory plays for us here. So the canonical example is topological homotopy theory, the category top of topological space of topological space becomes a model category uh, with, with the usual cylinder space in past case, the evident ones. The, the cylinders are those that, that are used to moderate the concept from. But now in other examples, these cylinder and space objects are something, maybe something more fancy. For instance, there's a model category that mod, you see, you see algebraic like super homotopy theory. That's just our category of DGC super algebra that we just spent some time with discussing. There is something called a projected model structure. And uh, one way to, to see what's going on is that in this model structure, um, past space objects are given by forming tensor product with, a, with polynomial differential forms on the interval. Do at least since we, you know, you should think of the opposite of this as being like a category of spaces. And then the dual of the past space object is an interval object, and, and the dual of forms on the interval is just the interval. So you see, this is just an advanced information of the fact that the interval produces cylinder objects by crossing. So this goes back to old ideas um, and what you do now, and the super version, which almost uh, easily the super refinement was made. This by the in the work on super theory. So this will play a role in the following. This is this will be the, the our model for a multiple theory of super spaces. And we do need to make progress in order the theory. We also need what will turn out to be an equivalent model for um, topological multiple theory based on synthesis. So this one's called simplicial multiple theory that will to play a big role in the discussion of Lie integration that I think we probably will call it tell us about. So, um, so the basic idea, very roughly, sticking to my, my rough superficial <laughs> explanations here. So we say that an n simplex is an n dimensional generalization of a triangle. So a two simplex is a filled triangle, a three simplex is a tetrahedron, and so forth, in the obvious, in the obvious, obvious way. And it's time to say, so a simplicial complex is just sort of a space that is viewed from a bunch of syntheses. Discrete space, if you wish, even though that. And then more generally, we say that a simplicial set is something 
just a little bit more general than a simplicial complex, it's something where for each natural number we have an abstract set, Xn, which we think of as being a set of n simplices. And then we just require that the function between these sets, so here's the set of zero simplices, a bunch of points, and of one simplices, a bunch of edges, a set of two simplices, a bunch of filled triangles. But they need not actually look like a simplicial complex as shown in this picture. And then we require that there's maps between these sets of abstract simplices that behave as if they, they would send every simplex to pieces of its boundary. So this map will take every edge to its source point and target point. And uh, there's a type of these arrows too. <laughs> oh no, sorry. It's, uh, so this will take to the source point and to the arrow point. These maps here, these D maps, will take a triangle and send it to, to any one of its three sides regarded as edges. And we require that uh, these maps satisfy some some relations that must be satisfied for this to have a consistent interpretation of assigned phases and, and degeneracies. And then it's called simplicity. So the so this plane will be this becomes a modern category, and the cylinder object, uh, say of the two simplex in this in this category will, will just look like so. So here's the two simplex, it's a triangle, we want to build a cylinder on it. We, we can't quite do it. We have to think about how to do it. Just drawing the evidence in it won't be a simplicial set. So we subdivide it in an evidence sense to make it a simplicial set. So that's how it works with simplicities. And, um, and um, a simplicial set is called a Kahn complex if two conditions are met, if all the empty n simplices may be composed in some way. So if you have adjacent and simply sees with you know, faces matched, then there's a notion of composing them like, like n airy, what is it, or n minus 1 airy gauge or gauge transformation should be composable. And such that under this composition, every cell, every n simplex has an inverse up to uh, other cells. <coughs> so, um, so these, these things are called Kahn complexes. You can, you can, if you have a high dimensional composition and inverses up to something, the way to think of it is as being higher generalizations of the concept of a group. If you have a group, a symmetry group, it's a basic example of this setup. If you look at ordinary geometric discrete group, then it does give a kind of complex called BG, which has a single zero simplex, which we should, should think of as being the thing that the, the symmetry group is a symmetry of, whatever it is, abstractly. Then the ones that we see those things that act are just labeled by the group elements. The two simplices in the simplicial set represent the fact that we have a product in the group. So we say we have a two simplex whenever we have two elements, yeah. for every two elements in the group. And then we say it's a triangle, the third face is labeled by the product of these two group elements. The three simplices represent the associativity of the product in this group. So we can check that. Actually, you know, definition that this is an example of the Kahn complex. And this way, Ordinary groups are examples, examples of these Kahn complexes. And so, more generally, we think of Kahn complexes as being generalizations of groups of symmetries in two ways. They have not just one dimensional symmetry transformations, but also symmetry of symmetry of symmetry transformations in general. And they need not have a single thing in the acron, but they may have done different things. That's what's called infinity group. The infinity is for having higher cells, and void is for having more things to act. Another amazing thing that Quillen proved in uh, 67, yeah, to say this, the first thing to say. So remember, we, we were talking about junctions and categories that played a big role. And now it turns out that junctions are also the, the supporting um, concept in homotopy <laughs> theory. So we want to say that an junction between all the categories, we call it a good junction, we call it a good junction, if very roughly it respects the cylinder objects. If the left adjoint of the junction respects our cylinder objects, and the right adjoint goes past the same. So the full definition is, is, is richer, but it implies in particular this fact, and since I focused on just the cylinders and the passive objects, that's, that's the definition for us at the moment. And then the basic fact of homotopy theory is that if you, if you have an adjunction on these model categories, remember from the model categories we could extract the homotopy theoretic information are passing to the homotopy categories, the good models for the homotopy classes of maps between them. And every equivalent junction does it, there is an adjunction on these uh, 
uh, one of the categories whose who is left and right joint functions are the derived functors of the original. So it's equivalent equivalence that induces an equivalent categories between the symmetric categories. So if we have equivalent equivalence, go to a junction between model categories, then we know that the two homotopy theories modeled by these two model categories are equivalent for practical purposes. And the, the key, key example is the one that Quillen proved in 67. It says that the categories of topological spaces and sufficient sets equipped with the model structures that I briefly indicated are actually Quillen equivalent. So the homotopy theory of topological spaces is really the same for the right notion of same as that of sufficient sets. Now among the good models, or the good models of these simple sets are these Kant complex explanations. So this really says that the homotopy theory of topological spaces is really that of infinity cubeoids. So they group with this model structure, model theory of topological spaces, it's really a generalization of group theory, knowing about the high Hayesian dimensions. Both of these model categories represent the homotopy theory of infinity cubeoids. Basics of homotopy theory. One reason we're interested in homotopy theory, apart from the fact that we're interested in gauge theory, is that it's a curious to observe that there's a remarkable richness in homotopy theory. Many things, many ordinary, all the ordinary constructions move from set theory and the homotopy theory analog, that tend to be vastly more interesting. So here's one thing that will play a big role for us. You have a pointed object in any homotopy theories, like a homotopy space or an algebra or something. The point just means if some object is like one to some object, like you map to that object. So if you have any other morphism to X, so look at this diagram. The space, you map to some coefficient, but we know what it means to so kind of pick zero in here. Then there's a concept of taking the homotopy file of this map. So if you have an ordinary category or an ordinary setup, you have any map and a pointer, you can ask what's the subset of all the elements that get mapped to the point. It would be the fiber over that point. Now in what we for, for saying this, we need to say, the image of these things is equal to the point. But we will never say equal anymore now, because we're doing what we do. So instead, the right way to say is we should look at all those elements that are homotopic, that are gauge equivalent to the point as we send them over. And uh, so, so the form of homotopy fiber is so the collection of all these things that are related with image and C is equal to the point up to a homotopy. Now it turns out where if you start with an ordinary morphism, in ordinary category form fibers, so you can show you can sequence the best. In the one theory, due to the fact that we form a modular fibers, we always get long, that's the origin of long sequences. So we start with the morphism here, we can form it to a multiple fiber. <coughs> uh, we can form it to a multiple fiber, but then we can also form the multiple fiber of the multiple fiber itself. Classically, that's always trivial, that's always the point. But now, in one of the theory, that's like we do it twice, you end up with the loop space, the loop object of the original object. So then you can keep going. You can then form the, the corresponding looping of the original map and take its homotopy fibers and keep going this way. So long fibers is going to emerge in the homotopy theory from the fact that we never say equal. And the case of interest for us is with these higher central extensions, Suppose you have such a closed cycle, and remember our definition of morphism of super infinity charges. A closed cycle of super infinity charge is a dually map of the Chevrolet Allenberg algebra. This is, do I have this anywhere? This is defined to be the Chevrolet Allenberg algebra that is just free on a single generated Allen degree P plus 2, trivial differential. And, and this map here this, that represents the closed cycle is dually just given by sending that generator to the closed cycle. Then we can ask for the not be fiber on the classifying map of that co cycle, and you find that what we find that's nothing but the higher central extension that we start with. So, central, ordinary central extensions and high, the high central extensions of super and infinity algebras are equivalent in nothing but the homotopy fibers of the <coughs> classifying maps of the co cycles that classify them. Alright, now we want to combine this. We, we talk about supergeometry, we talk about homotopy theory. Our aim is to produce geometry of physics that uh, can accommodate both, that, that knows both about the fact that space time contains fermions in the super aspect, but also high gauge transformations. 
All right, so far we have two, established two ingredients. Um, the Pauli explosion principle of physics is uh, witnessed by the fact that we are using supergeometry, whereas the, the gauge principle is witnessed by our use of homotopy theory. I want to combine this to form geometric infinity groupers. So far our infinity groupers are just geometrically discrete. I want to make them supergeometric and hence pass to higher supergeometry. This follows a general principle that was advertised by Roland way back in the early 60s. If you have any category of fine spaces, as we had at the beginning of this lecture, so for instance, fine schemes, or uh, Cartesian spaces among the smooth manifolds, or our super Cartesian spaces, R and Qs, then we will always bootstrap the notion of generalized spaces, spaces modeled on these. Geometry is seen, uh, you know, and the, the, physics, the physics way to think about this is this, these general spaces, should be a general geometry as seen by classical sigma models or modeled on these spaces. So the ideas here are very much physics inspired to determine what a generalized space X could be. You know, take some generalized space, you don't know yet what it is. Well, let's see how does a classical like, sigma model see that space. So that means for each brain world volume sigma in our category of defined spaces, we could ask uh, what is the collection of sigma model fields, of maps from sigma into that generalized space. We'll, we'll see more about this perspective in Eric Sharpie's talk. Now, if you do that, there's some minimum consistency conditions we should apply. Uh, we should apply. Um, so, so, first of all, yeah, really what I just said, if you, if you do have such a brain world volume, then there should be a set or really a simplicial set of would be maps of sigma monitors from sigma to x. Right? Ordinarily, you might think this should just be a plain set, there should just be a set of them. But if there's only four twisted sectors in the target space, or more generally, if the target space is a neat group board or a stack, as we will see in every stock, then you should actually assign an infinity group or a group board and then an infinity group board of such maps. You should account for the fact that there may be gauge transformations even between sigma model fields. So we'll assign a simplicial set, which gets this working title, map sigma comma x, even though x at this point doesn't exist yet, we're still defining it. But we may assign a simplicial set that should behave like a simplicial set of maps into it. And then we certainly want, as we, as we did before, that whenever we have a map between our brain world volumes, that there should then be a corresponding precomposition map between the set of sigma model fields. Right, if you have sigma field from sigma 1 to x, you can get one from sigma 2 to x simply by pre-composing to the phi. And this should clearly be compatible with composition of the phi's here. Now, in the language of category theory, these, these requirements are, are easily summarized. It simply says that the sign of classical sigma one field for generalized space x should be a functor from the opposite of the phi of whatever we to be our category of defined spaces to simplicial sets. Such a function is also called a simplicial pre-sheaf on the category of defined spaces. This is jargon. It says that for every guy in here, there's an infinity group void of ways of uh, mapping it into the book to the X. And so we can form this category of all these functors, objects of these functors, morphisms of the natural transformations between them, and it turns out to very nice model category structure so that we can talk about the, the homotopy theory of these simplicial pre sheaves. The simple objects are just object wise those of simplicial sets that we discussed before. So there's a homotopy theory of, of would be generalized spaces as seen by the classical sigma model fields. But we're not quite done yet, even though we, we impose these consistent these two conditions with a, you know we just require from the reality and applies, there's a, something more we should check. So so a key theorem in this business is traditionally known as the Yoneda lemma, but should really be thought of as being the bootstrap theorem in all functorial geometry. It says that if you take a brain world volume and regard it itself as being a generalized space in the every way, then the maps of generalized spaces, which are now defined as maps in this category of sheaves here, are actually equivalent to this original simplicial set that we declare to be. The simplicial set of maps without actually having the space axis. Now x 
exists as an object in this category of simple free sheaves. And so now we can ask for actual maps from sigma to it. The meta limit tells us that's actually consistent. The direct, consistent, direct consequence of the key consistent result that says if you consider homomorphisms between our brain world volumes regarded as defined spaces, it's actually the same as considering maps between them regarded as generalized spaces. So in other words, remembering our definition of fully faithful functor, the embedding of it's a full, fully faithful embedding of the fine spaces into these generalized spaces. And for the meta embedding. I guess I have to come to a close here. There's one more condi uh, condition we want to impose on our spaces. So far, we just know that kind of under composition, um, we can probe consistently. But we should also ask for the following. Suppose there's any notion that our brain is covered, as we say, an open cover by, by patches. Then, then a map out of sigma into our target space should be recoverable from maps out of these patches that are that consistently agree on overlaps. So I've written in these big boxes. So we can ask that the simple set of maps from sigma to x, sigma modifies directly from sigma to x. And we can look at the tuples of maps from the patches to x that agree on intersections up to a gauge transformation. So that the gauge transformations are in turn compatible on triple overlaps by gauge of gauge transformation. So this is kind of the space X seen from this decomposed picture of sigma, and this is the space X that's seen from sigma itself, and if it's really supposed to blue, we want this to be an equivalence here. So those generalized spaces that satisfy the fact that for every sigma that we cover is an equivalence, <coughs> they're called the higher sheaves, the infinity sheaves or infinity stacks on our category of defined spaces. There's a model category structure on our category of functors, which, which models these stacks, which, derived, which under derived functors models the full subcategory of all general space on those that satisfy this, this Lewin condition, this stack condition. So this model structure is the one we're interested in when we're doing geometry in a local sense, subject to some Lewin conditions. We want to work with the infinity stacks that are modeled as the good fiber coping objects on this side. This is a multiple theory of infinity stacks, and of course, because this thing are in infinity tops or higher tops. So this is the, the realm where higher or a multiple theory geometry takes place. So there's, there's a big dictionary, which I've uh, mentioned some parts of, that matches category theory, topos theory to really the geometry of generalized spaces. And um, maybe I'll close with this slide here. Now to get the highest super geometry, which is really the scenery in which all things spring and theoretically happen, we, we simply plug in the ingredients we establish. So we take our fine spaces, not to be, maybe ignore the form in here, to be our super Cartesian spaces. And then, and then we declare that, or we obtain super geometric homotopy theory as being that must be theory of infinity stacks, <coughs> infinity sheaves, on the simple Euclidean spaces. There's a rich amount of uh, traditional geometry uh, hidden in this construction. So the, the thing I just defined is the, is the homotopy theory down here in the bottom right. And it has loads of subcategories. So they're manifold, they're fully faithful, they're orbitals. Lee group all stacks, various formal versions. So lots of geometry happens in this high level. And I guess I'm out of time, and that's why I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Once you um, have geometry on these kind of complexes, you can ask the usual questions. You can ask, do I have a family of gauge transformations, smoothly or geometrically parametrized, that is or is not connected to the identity? <coughs> then you can speak about small and large. Or you can talk about uh, compact support once you have geometry, all the usual constructions. You see, we're not, we're not doing something different. We're just generalizing what we already did in a consistent way. We just say, let's go to a concept 
context where we cannot just talk about Gaussian summations, but also high Gaussian summations in a consistent way. And then you can speak about global and global high Gaussian summations. Uh, just a remark. So in the early days of supergeometry, like uh, 1982 or about that, Albert Schwartz, in search of generalization of supermanifolds, introduced what is known as uh, Schwartz superspaces, which is basically contravariant functors from a uh, category of Grassmann algebras or Bereisian algebras, which exactly functions on a fine space in a sense to sets. And well, under some work, one can distinguish between them uh, what uh, corresponds to supermanifolds. So what you what you introduce is understand the simplicial objects in the category of Schwartz spaces. Yeah, not quite. Yeah, I should have mentioned Schwartz. Schwartz considered the category just of super Grassmann, of Grassmann algebras, which is the category of super points. Uh, no, this is, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, it was uh, Grassmann. Well, actually, he considered various uh, options. Well, most most generous category. Uh, well, uh, you have contravariant functors from category of any commutative super algebras to sets. Mm, but he was interested in the, what ca what kind of algebras can distinguish real objects, and he considered options where you consider either Grassmann algebras or what you call Bereisian algebra. Bereisian algebra by definition is the algebra of C infinity functions on R and N. So exactly uh, on affine space. And there was some work, as I said, how to distinguish between them. So super manifolds, it was done by my namesake, so, uh, Sasha Warren, actually. And so yes, so there, there are various possible algebras considered there. Yeah, I should have maybe added more. Uh, so nothing of what I said is uh, it was original stuff, all these uh, non things in the So Schwartz is 1982 or uh, between 82 and 84. Was it a good model for super formal Cartesian paper? Category? Concrete description? You want to better know that now? Yeah, that's a, that's a way to do it. Yeah, so I had, I had the word super formal Cartesian spaces, so one can, just as we added uh, odd infinitesimal generators to our algebra, we can just add even nil potent generators, and then we get something that has sort of triple degrading. Ordinary finite directions, commutative infinitesimal directions, which, which incidentally was also considered by Schwartz. And did I understand you right that you say that for describing the smooth parts you don't need C infinity rings anymore, you can do that with plain commutative algebra? Yeah, that's, that's a, a thing that kept kind of maybe puzzling the community a bit. Um, you don't need C infinity rings to just have minus So.
Any final question? Well, just, just one, one more remark, if you allow. So you mentioned first, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Gifan duality in, as, as a model, but uh, Gifan duality requires considering in parallel Hausdorff topological space and uh, particular class in binary algebra. It's interesting that it's less well known that before Gilfan theory, there was the Gilfan Kumagora theory, uh, which uh, didn't require any topological structure on the algebra side. So there's a theorem that you can reconstruct due to Gilfan Kumagora before one algebra theory, which you can reconstruct your topological space from the uh, algebra of continuous function, real value, not complex, real value of continuous function without any topology of the algebra. Just purely knowing the algebra, you can get this. It's one drawback that you don't know the image, so to say. You don't, so when you introduce bound algebras, you know the other side of the, of the story. So, but uh, before you doing that, you don't know that. But one advantage is, is the other side is pure algebraic. I see, I do not. So that's the direct analog of, of this method. Yeah, yeah. Who said again? Say, uh, Gilfan Kulmagor. Uh, Gilfan uh, used to be Kulmagor actually a student. Right? So it was a paper, a joint paper of 1939 or something. But it's a very little, well, less known than the Gilfan Jerry. You find branched off a developing norm to theory, bound algebra theory after that. So but this preceded it. Okay.